pleased to uh, introduce our uh, guest speakers. We have one um, live here and one <clears throat> live in the ethersphere that we'll be doing this together. So this is a little bit of an experiment. I want to uh, give a great thanks to our colleagues in the Department of Psychiatry for uh, their offer to sort of provide uh, tips and tools, if you will, for uh, dealing with our COVID pandemic. We have two outstanding speakers from the Department of Psychiatry. First is Emily Bay, who is here um, with us uh, in the room. I ha had so much fun reading her uh, bio. She is originally uh, got her undergraduate training at Duke and then came to Davis to do her, uh, psych her um, get her medical degree and then stayed to do her psychiatry. What is so fun to me is that she has fellowships and things I have never even heard of. So she, in addition to her um, psychiatry residency, she did a fellowship in psychoanalytical and psychotherapy training that I actually have heard of. Yeah. And then <clears throat> psychosomatic medicine fellowship on top of that. So um, as we, we are all subspecialists in our own fields and it's really uh, interesting to appreciate the degree of subspecialty that exists in uh, allied and other uh, professional fields as well. On the, on the outside world, on the screen, is uh, Melissa Hopkins, who uh, got her undergraduate degree in Pomona. I have a suspicion she's probably a California person, then went back to Maryland for her MD degree before going to UCSF for her psychoanalytic and psychotherapy training, as well as some focused behavioral training um, at uh, San Francisco General. So I really appreciate the two of you coming to um, talk to a bunch of surgeons. I suspect this hasn't been uh, a common a piece on your agenda to have 150 surgeons listening to uh, psychiatry about how you can help us, but it just goes to show how much we all are uh, getting together during this really unusual time. So thank you, and I will turn it over to Dr. Bates. Right. Thank you, Dr. Farmer, and um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, as she said, I'm Dr. Bay, I'm uh, Emily Bay, I'm one of the psychiatrists uh, over in the hospital and in the Behavioral Health Center. Um, you all may have seen my name on some of the charts for your patients. I am actually primarily in the consult um, world, so uh, when our patients need a surgeon and a psychiatrist, <laughs> um, we're happy to be helpful in that situation. Um, and this is my colleague, uh, Melissa Hopkins. Uh, do you wanna check and see if everyone can hear you? Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Hopkins. It's nice to meet, meet you all. Um, and I am in psychiatry. I'm actually a child adolescent psychiatrist in the department. Uh, and I uh, tend to be an outpatient and work a lot with our trainees. Uh, but I also work in primary care with primary care physicians to support the mental health needs of their patients. So you may not have seen me, but I've only been at UC Davis for, uh, since October. It was at UCSF before that. So. I hope that I will get to meet more of you during the time that we work together. All right, so let me reorient you on the screen here. There you are. Let me put you up here. Okay. Um, so I wanted to first off acknowledge that um, this is a strange way to have a talk about well-being in a number of ways, right? Um, you know, ideally we would have a small group where everybody could kind of talk about their own kind of individual struggles and we'd um, kind of process those things and give some individual tips. But of course with a large group that's a little complicated. And then also um, during this pandemic having a lot of folks online in other places and um, so there's not necessarily a lot of opportunity to get into small groups or talk with your neighbor six feet away, right? So um, we're going to be utilizing a couple of different um, tools to kind of try to make this more interactive, more interesting, things like that. So um, the first one is this poll everywhere. Um, so can you guys see this link in blue here? So the, what this is is kind of a, an opportunity to do an online poll where we can see responses in real time. So there are two ways that you can uh, participate and I hope that you will uh, with your phone um, you can either go you go to your web browser and log into the pollev.com slash my name Emily Bay 753 
and that will allow you to participate. The other way you can do it is you can text my name, Emily Bay 753 to the, the number 22333. So that's what you would put, 22333 you'd put up in your, like where you'd put your contact, and then you text my name, and that'll allow you to engage in that too, okay? All right, um, so let's start with some learning objectives. Um, so we want to kind of give you some concrete tips, um, understand how the COVID-19 outbreak might contribute to stress um, for direct care providers. So we are kind of a, you know, I think everyone right now is pretty stressed, but I think folks in the medical uh, field and who are taking care of patients directly have some particular um, struggles and things that we can help with. Um, we also want you to come away understanding what emotional and physical reactions to stress might look like. And then identify maybe some adaptive and some maladaptive coping skills that we use. And then think about how to practice resilience building, um, including some mindfulness. All right, so on that note, we're gonna start off with a mindfulness exercise together. Um, and Dr. Bay, please let me know if there are any technical issues as I'm running through this. So, um, we'll talk a little bit more about mindfulness later this morning, um, but before we jump in, we're going to be doing um, a scripted mindfulness exercise, so something that is pretty common in our field and is often used for groups. And uh, so we'll be doing this together. Uh, during this exercise, you'll be asked to practice what's called diaphragmatic breathing, if you haven't heard of that already. Um, so to do this, you're going to engage your abdominal muscles to inhale and relax uh, to exhale. Each breath in should be through your nose, and each breath out should be through your mouth. These are slow breaths. Each inhale and exhale should last at least three to five seconds each, with a brief one to two second pause between phases. The exhale should be longer than the inhale. And this way of breathing becomes very natural, second nature. Um, as you get used to it. And it's uh, really a wonderful way to manage your stress in the moment. So I do recommend becoming familiar with this if it's not already something that you do to, to manage in the moment stress. And then also to be able to do this uh, through mindfulness. So let's begin. So sit in any way that you wish that is comfortable and relaxed. Begin by bringing your attention into your body, to your breathing. You can close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. Start by taking a few deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Make sure that as you are breathing, you are practicing slow, diaphragmatic breathing. As you take a deep breath, Imagine oxygen filling your lungs and entering your body. As you exhale, you release and have a sense of relaxing more deeply. With each breath in, feel the air rushing in through your nostrils, into your lungs, your abdomen and chest expanding and rising. With each breath out, notice the air passing your lips, your chest and abdomen relaxing and falling. Now allow your focus to expand to the sensations in your body. You can notice your body. Feel the weight of your body on the chair you're sitting on. You can notice your feet on the floor. Notice the sensations of your feet touching the floor or your shoes. The weight, the pressure, vibration, temperature, texture. 
texture. You can notice your legs against the chair. Pressure. Heaviness. Lightness. Notice your back against the chair. Take a breath. If your mind drifts, notice whatever pulled your attention. Then allow yourself to refocus on your breathing and on your body sensations. Bring your attention into your abdomen. If it feels tight or tense, let it soften. Take a breath. Notice your hands. Are they tight or tense? See if you can allow them to soften. Notice your arms. Feel any sensation in your arms. Let your shoulders relax and be soft. Notice your neck and throat. Let them be soft. Relax. Take a breath. Soften your jaw. Let your face and facial muscles relax. Now expand your awareness to your whole body. Take a breath. Be aware of your whole body as best you can, the sensations, your breathing. Take three breaths, and then when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back into the room. Are we all still awake? Anybody <laughs> fall asleep? <laughs> all right. I, I feel much more relaxed. <laughs> um, so let's kind of dive in uh, and just start with, you know, uh, maybe an obvious question, but maybe not. How have you been feeling lately? So let me open up going to activate so you can go ahead and um, put in your responses. Anxious. Lots of anxious already. So the nice thing about this is the words get bigger as we have multiple responses. So the words that are largest are the ones that are most common to everyone. Lots of tired and anxious. I'm bored. Where's that bored one coming from? Is this because we're not we're not doing as many elective procedures or okay. <laughs> so 
so slow, lonely, isolated, hopeless, sad. COVID is an emotion we're, we're, st we're starting to identify now. Overloaded, scared, worried, overwhelmed. Yeah. I think most of us can relate to all these feelings these days. Um, really kind of a tough, uh, worrisome time. So let's take a look at, you know, of course, our internet memes have been some source of relief for a lot of folks, I think, for me at least. And I think this one is really kind of awesome. Um, it helps to capture a lot of the different feelings that we're all going through, things like shock at the fact that we're not prepared for this, right? That we don't seem to have the resources we need. Feeling betrayed maybe by um, folks who we think are supposed to protect us and help us get through it, but feeling like we don't have their support. Maybe envy for um, people who get to stay home and stay safe while we go to a hospital where we may be exposed to something scary. Um, frustration when people don't social distance, when they don't wear a mask, when they're not respectful, um, when we're out there in the world. Uh, maybe fear that we're gonna get the virus ourselves. For me, I know it's, I have a lot of fear about bringing it home to my daughter who's very young. Um, maybe foreboding. I, th I think I feel this a lot right now because we haven't seen a surge yet, but we're sort of waiting, we're holding our breath. Um, exhaustion when we're working hard, grief about uh, maybe loss of uh, people we know personally or our patients, terror, fear, but then maybe also some um, positive emotions to solidarity with our medical community, um, feeling courage, like we're sort of going into battle, like we're ready to kind of fight this enemy, um, hope maybe that that things are starting to look up, or that maybe we have flattened the curve, maybe we've done a good job, maybe we've, um, we've addressed things early enough. So all these things, right, the internet is telling us that we've, ever, lots of people all over the country, the world, are feeling this way uh, and that we're not alone. So just to recap, uh, Fear of transmission and contamination, anxiety about our family, friends, health, health work, um, increased physical and emotional work demands, um, possible separation from our families, and then all these changing procedures, right? Like I get an email every day that tells me something different, some new procedure, some new um, process that we're putting in place, and that, that can be really overwhelming and destabilizing too. All right, so let's jump into our next poll. Um, and so same thing as before. Um, this time the question is, what are some physical and emotional indicators that your stress level is high for you? Um, and we're going to make this, again, another word cloud, so just single one or two word answers so that we can visualize it nicely. Actually, this one you can, you can do a, a longer uh, sentence if you want. This is a little different format, so tachycardic. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, absolutely. We'll talk a little bit more about some of these physical responses. Yep, mm -hmm. definitely eating our emotions. Crying, yep. I'm going to make you a little smaller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. We're going to run through most of these as we're covering the next few slides, but there are a variety of ways that we can both respond behaviorally as well as our bodies can respond to stress. Um, and so certainly I'm seeing some of the behavior changes here, ways that we're trying to cope with our coping strategies, some more adaptive and some less. Um, and also the physical manifestations of stress in our bodies, I see insomnia on there several times, irritability on there several times, 
definitely sleep issues and fatigue. Those are common ones too. So we'll run through some of these in a second as well. Um, but, uh, and just to also say there's no one way that people respond to stress, um, of course. And so everybody's experiences are going to be a little bit unique. Um, Oh, I should say here, did we pass out the worksheets, Dr. Bay? Oh, gosh. I forgot That's the worksheets. Okay. I'm so sorry. That's all right. We, um, we, it's okay. We can, we'll make this up as we go along. We had uh, a last-minute idea that it might be nice to have you all write down some of the signs for yourself to kind of watch out for. So if you have a worksheet that was sent out through email, I'm not sure this went out. They did great. Um, if not, if you can just jot down either on your phones or a piece of paper if you have one in front of you, some of the things we'll ask you as we go through. Um, but as we're going through the rest of the slides, just be reflecting on yourself and kind of how these um, various things that we're talking about might apply to you. Um, and the idea being that then you'll have a nice visual afterward of some of the things that we're talking about uh, to keep an eye on and to also be mindful about. So um, as we've already kind of discussed, there are many types of emotional reactions to stress, and there's no one way that people respond. Um, some of the common feelings that people might have are fear and sadness, feeling disconnected, feeling hopeless or guilty, grief, loss or shock, loss of confidence. And then there can also be a whole bunch of different types of positive reactions that you can have, including appreciation, um, a, a feeling of connectedness, strengthening of spiritual beliefs. Um, and so whatever the emotional reactions are that you are having to this or any stressor in your life, there is a tremendous power in naming that experience and putting a word to it. Um, and that has the incredible effect of allowing us to think about what's happening and understand it better and cope better. Um, and so when you're in the middle of an overwhelming experience, you may not be necessarily taking that step back to look at it and think about it and recognize what it is. Um, and so the naming process and recognizing your emotion, um, that's what we call containing. It contains the feeling. Um, and so this is something that is, is very helpful in of itself. And then looking at the next slide, um, we'll switch to talking about physical reactions. So a lot of these were ones that you already have mentioned. Um, and so stress causes, as you all know, a sympathetic response in our bodies. So the fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, and when this is happening, uh, it's harder to think uh, because higher level cognitive processes go offline. Um, and so it can be really difficult to think and be calm um, in the middle of an extreme stress. Um, and so stress causes changes in cortisol levels and immune functioning. Um, and then kind of in the immediate period, you can have increases in blood pressure, um, heart rate of breathing, uh, muscle tension and spasm, poor sleep and fatigue and exhaustion changes in appetite and libido, and then a whole bunch of different types of physical symptoms, including headaches, nausea, feeling dizzy, et cetera, just to name a few. But again, there are many ways that you may react physically. And it's important to notice how your body reacts to stress, to be able to recognize it, to be able to say, oh, this is happening to me right now, um, and to pause and take a step back from that. That in and of itself is helpful, um, in addition to naming the feeling that you're having. So here is our, our first um, worksheet moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you do have a way to write this down, um, so the first thing is to write down three physical or emotional signs that you are stressed, so things that happen for you specifically, to just jot them down. And again, we're going to kind of use this as a visual to keep later to be able to recognize when you're having stress. We'll just spend a moment on this. Okay, um, so let's move on and try to kind of be a little more specific about some of these things that we've been talking about. So we're going to do another poll. So what are some of the positive things that you do to cope with stress, things that you're 
you feel are helpful, that you're proud of, that you feel are um, useful, that you'd like to share with other people. Exercise, yes, that one's a big, a big one that can be really useful to kind of chill out that those uh, that stress response, right? Singing, is that like singing in the shower, singing at karaoke? Is that not someone in the room, maybe? Lots of exercise, cooking, <clears throat> hobbies, meditating, that's awesome. Praying. Someone said work. That's another way to cope. Playing with your toddler, oh. Talking to family, drinking good wine. Appreciating and being grateful for what we have, definitely. FaceTiming family, that's kind of a nice um, sort of silver lining, right, that we've all sort of discovered FaceTime, Zoom, all that stuff, or maybe in, in contact with folks who are further away. Cleaning, organizing, walks, that's all great. Bonding with family. Dogs, I like that one too, awesome. So these are what we would call adaptive coping skills. Um, and these two photos are of um, my daughter and Melissa's son um, who are demonstrating how we can do some of these adaptive coping skills. So um, exercise, yoga, yoga, tai chi, um, that diaphragmatic breathing that we were doing earlier can be really useful. Um, cognitive strategies, so things like trying to reframe some of the negative, um, heavy, depressing feelings that we have or um, thoughts that we have, trying to think about them in a new way that feels more positive. Hydration, nutrition, sleep, uh, making sure we're engaging it in activities, uh, leisurely hobbies, things like that. Um, make sure we're balancing work demands. So yeah, work can be a good coping mechanism. It can help to distract us, but making sure we're not um, going too far in that direction. And then utilizing support from friends, family, coworkers, that kind of thing. So um, here we've got our friend who is playing tennis and our friend who is reading a good book uh, to cope. <laughs> so, now let's move on to the other side of that coin. What are some negative things that we do to try to cope with stress? Eat, yeah, drinking. <laughs> I think those are the two, those are the two big ones for sure. Work. Mm -hmm. Oh, spending money. Oh my goodness. Amazon is like thriving right now, right? <laughs> Withdrawal. Is that, that's kind of isolating, huh? kind of um, sticking to yourself, not reaching out. Constantly looking at email. Nachos. <laughs> that sounds delicious. Um, Reddit. My husband has that problem. He has a Reddit problem. He's just always scrolling on Reddit. What's, what's Hoover Air? Is that a typo, maybe? Oh, Uber Eats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of common themes here. Food, alcohol, shopping and work, right? Okay, so let's think about now our maladapting, adaptive coping skills. So this is my daughter over drinking and Melissa's son overeating. <laughs> um, so toddlers have these problems also. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that we see a lot is the working around the clock, right? Not taking breaks, um, not checking in with colleagues, isolating. Um, that's how we've learned to cope with life, right? As physicians, we are doers. 
So when we get stressed, we, um, we dive into work, we, uh, we want to feel useful and productive and uh, ready to take on the world. Um, and that can be good in some ways, but I think oftentimes we overdo that. So binging on food, alcohol, gambling, or whatever your vice may be, right? Um, online shopping, <laughs> that kind of thing. And then really focusing on the negative or overgeneralizing our fears. Um, a word we use in psychiatry a lot is catastrophizing, right? Um, sort of blowing things out of proportion um, that can be really stressful. So, one more poll here. I wanted to focus also just on work in particular. So, how do you practice self-care at work? When you're here in the hospital, when you're working hard, when things can be stressful, in the OR, between cases, maybe. Coffee. Looking out for co-presidents? Co-residents? Co-residents, co there it is. <laughs> Deep breathing. Making sure our team is well cared for. Water. Probably water. Brief moment of mindfulness alone before a case. Bubbly water, yeah. A walk. Taking breaks. Making time to pray. Clean my office. <laughs> A little therapeutic. Marie Kondoing, is that? Hand washing. That's 20 seconds that you can just be mindful, right? Like 20 seconds of just thinking about washing your hand. Being smart about PPE. That sounds a little stressful to me. <laughs> Engaging with people around me. So, and I think that's, that's one thing that's, um, that can be a little counterintuitive, that that can be really helpful is sort of taking care of people around you rather than kind of focusing inward on your own stress, on your own um, sort of worries, thinking about how we can take care of our residents, our students, that kind of thing can be useful too. All right, let's see here. Oops. So, um, you know, self-monitoring, pacing, taking breaks, taking timeouts. So a lot of you guys have already identified that. Doing regular check-ins with colleagues, with family and friends. Um, working in a supportive partnership or a team. Doing regular peer consultation, supervision. Brief relaxation or stress management. Music, humor at work. Um, my husband is a, a hospitalist here, and so I hang out sometimes in their office with buddies of mine. They started to do wall sits three times a day. So they'll just do, like all of them will get together six feet apart, of course, with max, masks on, and they'll just do a wall sit for a minute. Um, and I think that's really helped to kind of boost the mood and um, help to, to get people feeling good. So that's nice. All right, what do I got here? So this is, uh, we'll take another moment just if you want to write something down, maybe three things that are adaptive coping strategies that you want to do or to utilize to manage your stress, and maybe three things that you want to avoid or you think that um, are maladaptive coping. So starting to put this together a little bit, um, you may have seen this. Uh, this is not a, a graphic that was developed for healthcare, um, but here we have these uh, different zones. And so the idea being that there are um, different zones that we can find ourselves during any type of stressful situation, but specifically during the pandemic. Um, and we want to move from the fear zone into the learning zone into the growth zone. And so this fear zone. Um, to note signs that you may be in that zone 
or may have been in that zone. So, you know, hoarding of essential items, um, spreading your emotions, so kind of becoming caught up in whatever it is and acting it out without being able to, like, think or notice it, um, complaining a lot, just sort of, like, pan forwarding messages about what's going on in the world, people getting mad very easily, just to name a few. Um, so this is the fear zone. And then in the learning zone, um, starting to notice your emotions, identify them, and again, kind of, like, putting words to them. Um, and being able to, to start to work toward acceptance. So um, so giving up that you can't control everything, um, stop sort of like compulsively consuming things and those more like maladaptive strategies, um, becoming aware of what is happening and then actually being able to think. Um, so that's a sign that maybe the stress response has calmed down a little bit and you're able to bring back on those higher level cognitive processes. Um, evaluating information and thinking about it before sort of spreading it um, and then having some compassion for yourself and others recognizing that everyone's trying to do their best in a difficult situation and then in the growth zone um, so this is where you're able to really think about other people um, and try to help them and, and help people who are in more situations than you which a lot of us are already doing um, with work every day but also kind of in our personal lives as well being able to stay in the present moment um, and think about the future and kind of, you know, past this immediate stress. Um, being, again, the self-compassion, so um, being empathetic with yourself and with other people, being able to be compassionate. Being um, thankful and appreciative um, and kind of maintaining a more neutral to, to positive state, uh, an optimistic state. Um, being able to adapt to change and stress and then practicing quietude, patience, um, relationships, and creativity. So think about where, where you may be um, on here, um, and maybe start to think about ways that you might be able to, to move into the more growth zone um, over time if you haven't already started to transition. I think that um, you know, naturally we kind of move between states. It's not always like a steady progression from one to the other. You can have a good day and a bad day and backslide. And you know, the idea being that we want to be aware of where we are um, and mindful of that and trying to move forward into a more healthy or adaptive uh, state. All right, so let's talk about resilience, which is a hot, hot topic. Um, and we're just going to touch on this a little bit today. Um, resilience is, uh, well, first to just define it a little bit, so it's the capacity to resume positive functioning following adversity. Um, it's a person's ability to adapt successfully to acute stress, trauma, or chronic forms of adversity. Um, it's the process of adapting in the face of trauma, threats, or significant stress. Um, and then it's not an immutable trait or a limited resource. This is something that you can work toward to build in yourself over time. Um, and resilience isn't necessarily something that we think about in like an acute stress. Um, it's often thought about as being something that over time we can develop. Um, and um, but that being said, in the middle of a, a highly stressful period, in the middle of this pandemic, there are things that we can do to increase our resilience in the face of that stress. Um, and so this is kind of one way to think about, about yourself in this reflective process that we've been going through today. Uh, and so one of the things that we can do that improves resilience is cultivating healthy habits. Um, and that's my son um, trying to be an artist to show us how to be mindful and healthy. Um, and on the next slide, um, we have 10 habits of resilience. And so these are just to name a few. There are many, many, many more. Um, so staying optimistic, practicing altruism, cultivating a strong moral compass, embracing faith and spirituality, using your sense of humor, finding positive role models, identifying positive social supports, not avoiding anxiety provoking situations. Um, and, and with that one, just to say, the idea being that avoidance actually perpetuates anxiety. Um, and so facing an anxious situation um, or trigger can actually improve your ability to tolerate that stress um, and will over time decrease the anxiety. So this is something that we can do to improve our resilience. Um, finding meaning in life and then practicing. Practicing using all of these different techniques over time. It takes time to build this. This is a chronic thing. Um, and so which of these things do you think that you use um, and what could you do, do more of? Just reflect a little bit on that as we um, move on to the next slide and think a little bit more about mindfulness. So to come full circle here, 
Um, we started off with this mindfulness exercise. So mindfulness is a great way to improve your ability to be resilient. Um, and the idea behind this is that um, with mindfulness and meditation for that matter, they're, they're a little bit different, but they come from similar principles. Um, the idea being that you can increase your awareness of what's happening in your mind and your body, um, your thoughts, your feelings, physical sensations. And by increasing your awareness of that, you can notice and accept and kind of release. Um, and so not getting kind of caught up in those temporary states that are always changing, um, but kind of having a more centered um, self. And so with mindfulness, there are many, many ways to be mindful. Um, certainly breathing exercises, the diaphragmatic breathing that we went through before, um, mindfulness exercises, there are many, many good resources for that. Um, you can do visualizations. Um, just enriching your life can be a mindful activity if you're intentional about that. Um, one of the best, I think, resources out there available today are various technologies. Um, probably many of you have heard of um, some of the apps that are out there. Um, one of my favorites um, is called Headspace. If you haven't checked it out, it's actually free for anybody with an NPI number through the end of the year. Um, you can just go on to the website and register, um, and you can just put in your NPI number, and there's an app on your phone, and it has a zillion different guided meditations and um, you can focus on anxiety or sleep or energy. There's a lot of different things you can focus on. So I, I highly recommend checking that out if you haven't already um, as a great way to sort of in, introduce some mindfulness into your life. Um, and, you know, this, through this you can explore the power of your mind. Um, and I will just also add that the idea here being that um, in of itself, taking a step back from whatever it is that is happening and noticing it and reflecting um, is very powerful. And that can help you kind of get through. If you're just kind of caught up in the day-to-day -day and you're moving from thing to thing at a fast pace and you're not um, taking pauses, over time, the cumulative effect of that can really contribute to burnout um, and to anxiety and depression. And so um, intentionally having this space where you can notice what's happening for you um, in the long run is very helpful. And so we're kind of leveraging these concepts when we think about um, how to cope through the pandemic and the, the increased stress that you're all under. So we wanted to talk a little bit about local resources. Um, and again, as everybody gets um, buried in emails, you guys have all this information. It just may be sort of buried in your inbox. But um, we do have a UC Davis Physicians Health and Wellbeing um, Committee here. We have Dr. Yellowlees, who's our well-being champion. Um, so that's a good resource. We actually do have a wellness survey that you can take just to Kind of gauge how you're doing right um and if that wellness survey looks concerning to you there's a an easy way to kind of reach out for help from our um, local resources for therapy um, in that survey um, also one of our colleagues um, actually a colleague in internal medicine has started to do a stress reduction skills session on wednesday mornings at 7 45. Um, it's just through a zoom it's a group um, thing and she's sort of doing a lot of, teaching a lot of skills, things that we've talked about today, mindfulness, meditation, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, ASAP, or our um, Academic Staff Assistance Program, is also doing daily, these, these group uh, drop-ins daily by Zoom. And there's an email there that you can um, use to reach out to that person if, you're, if you feel like that would be useful. Okay, and I can um, I can send these out to via your um, folks too. So final slide for a little levity. Um, this is my daughter wearing some um, PPE that is not effective, right? It's <laughs> an adult size mask. <laughs> She's um, not sure about it. Um, and Melissa's son with a pup, always a nice stress reliever, right? To be with animals and. Um, they're always mindful, right? They're always in the present. <laughs> um, so I think that's all we have. Um, can I answer any questions for folks? Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Well, first, <clears throat> I just want to say thank you guys both for doing this. I don't know what you can see or not hear, but really appreciate uh, Melissa, you online, and coming early in the morning for thank us. You. I've learned from your chair that seven o'clock is not her favorite time. <laughs> uh, so we had to
department chair meetings, and you can tell the early risers and the not so early risers. Absolutely. Uh, so I really appreciate you guys doing this for us. Of course, thank um, you. So I just want to push a little bit. Uh, so first of all, we surgeons are always doing something at 7:45 and lots of other things, and we're sort of constitutionally not good at not being in the game. We're like wired all the time. <laughs> and it's almost harder, you know, this isn't our crisis. Like, we're really good at trauma. We really, we kind of right. like it. Uh, we thrive on it, I think. That it's sort of what defines the choices people make in medical school. But this is really hard for us because this isn't, isn't our thing. Um, and well, while we're really happy that Sacramento hasn't seen the big surge, because we were ready. <laughs> so and that's not, you know, it's a generalization. And there's certain many other issues related to it. And I think most of we're all smart enough to say, because we talk to our colleagues in New York, we're way happier that this is the reality for us for many reasons. But I don't know, is that, you know, I guess I shouldn't ask a psychiatrist if that's a thing, right? <laughs> she might say yes. <laughs> so I'm going to find another way to frame it. No, but, no. You know, what's wrong with us? <laughs> Face <laughs> right? <laughs> oh my gosh. No. I um so I I mean I think I the way I conceptualize that is that we've all learned different ways to cope with stress. And um this is how this group of people or many of you have learned to cope with stress is to be in the game and be busy and to be helping. So much. It's funny, I reached out when I, before we did this talk, I reached out to a friend of mine who's a surgeon and I said, what do you think would be helpful? And what she came back saying is that, you know, our surgeon colleagues are, we're so used to being highly competent and in control. And this situation is just the opposite of that, right? Um, you know, like if the, we're not in control. We don't have, we don't know what's going to happen. We're feeling a lot of uncertainty. Um, and that, you know, that that is especially stressful for folks who really like, who have sort of built their life around making sure that they can do what they're best at and do it really well. Um, so it's not, it's not that you're sick or, <laughs> you know, that, that it's a big problem. It's just sort of how um, we've learned to cope, you know. And so uh, it's tough. It's challenging to take a step back and to... Um, like Melissa was saying, take a moment, sort of be reflective, um, to not necessarily be busy, but be able to kind of reframe how you're coping with the with the stress. Um, I don't know, Melissa, do you have other things to other thoughts? I would I would just echo that, and you know, like we were talking about before, there's no one way to react, and that is in part because all of our situations are different. Um, and certainly, you know, we are not in your world. Um, but that being said, I think the helplessness of not being able to do what you do um, to help could be a common theme. And uh, just like Dr. Bain was saying, to take a step back and to notice that feeling and just to allow it to be whatever it may be. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with any of those reactions. It makes a lot of sense that this is the way that you operate, literally, um, and um, that's how you're going to react. Um, and so that's okay, that's you, and uh, have some self-compassion for that is how you are. Um, and that's, we're all doing the best we can. So it just made me think that there's probably a new field out there, like psychotherapy for surgeons. I think this is also part of why uh, surgeons have a particularly hard time retiring, because yeah. they don't know how to do other things. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hiroshi. <laughs> Thank you so much for a great okay. talk. I think for surgeons, at least for, for me personally, part of the the problem is is that a lot of you know what you said in terms of the the um, the, the good coping strategies, in terms of finding meaning. I think a lot of us are very single minded about the meaning we have in our lives and, and our work, and it's surgery. And in this situation, a lot of that's been taken away from us, and so you lose that. And then on top of it, you have this weird sense of guilt and selfishness because you're like, I, I don't feel good about coming to work, but how, how great is it that, you know, we're not seeing a big surge of patients and that we're doing okay and we're doing the right thing. And yet 
why do I feel crappy about this? So there's this weird cognitive dissonance in your head mm -hmm. about doing the right thing and yet feeling crappy about it. Mm -hmm. And really, I think part of it is that the, for, for, for the psychopathology of the surgeons, of really just your work being de a defining sort of pillar in your life, mm -hmm. we've lost that, and a lot of us haven't really acknowledged that there's been a loss. And frankly, personally, I'm not well um, armed with coping strategies to deal with that loss. It's the same reason why Dr. Farmer says people don't want to retire, because once you stop being a surgeon, you look at yourself and say, well, so who am I? Mm -hmm. And it's not that simple for us, because to do this job, you have to be so single-minded about it that you lose a lot of parts of yourself to mm -hmm. do this. I think that's something that we're struggling with, and it's, it's hard to verbalize without feeling very selfish about it. I think you actually verbalized it beautifully. And I think that's the first step, is like understanding that conflict, right? And sort of exploring that within yourself. It sounds like you've done a great job of that. Um, and, you know. Still eating nachos, though. <laughs> I, I'm into the nachos. I mean, you know, every once in a while, I think it's, I think it's a good idea. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that we talked about a little bit but didn't really expand on is the sort of um, cognitive reframing. So, um, you know, thinking about, okay, I can't do this thing that I've devoted my life to that um, is so central to my identity, and I, I can't do it and I feel sort of lost without it. Trying to reframe that um, by thinking to myself, okay, I've spent so much of my life doing this this particular thing, and other things have fallen away. I haven't been able to focus on them. Maybe this is my opportunity to find something else that I wish that I could have um, spent more time on. Maybe something that I was interested in in the past that I didn't, I haven't been had time to engage in. Or, um, you know, I think part of maybe part of uh, one strength that we could utilize here is the single-mindedness, the dedication, the um, action-oriented sort of personality and thinking about how to repurpose that in a different direction for the short time, hopefully. Um, so trying to kind of turn, turn things around a little bit, thinking about them in a positive way, um, which, you know, I will be the first to acknowledge that that feels a little superficial at first, but it's kind of a good habit that I think is helpful in the long run. Anything else you... Melissa, maybe I'll throw this one to you. Yeah, I mean, there are so many great resources out there. And I think that um, it's been interesting to kind of watch the evolution. I, I certainly am in the same boat. I've had a lot of questions from um, people in my life who are not in, in medicine. Um, and, you know, whether you're in medicine or not, we all have these reactions to what's happening. And so kind of if you think about that, um, the zones graph that we looked at before, um, you know, thinking about where are people on that um, and, you know, wanting to kind of send people to like the right resources. I know early on in the pandemic, there was a lot of misinformation and panic happening in the world. And so I'm kind of taking a step back from that and noticing that this is an emotional reaction to uncertainty and fear um, and that we can look at the facts and look at the data and kind of make educated decisions um, about that, that that can be helpful. And another thing that I've had, there's been a bunch of people who come and kind of asking questions about what to do or what's happening or what's the truth. Um, and then there are other people who have been completely dissociated from what's happening and not acknowledging it and just kind of carrying on with their lives as normal. And, you know, I think that I have certainly had the reaction in those situations um, to want to, like, push people to um, to be more responsible about themselves, to, to, to say it kindly. Um, and, you know, you can't force people to do what you want them to do. <laughs> um, and so while you can talk to them, you can create a space to educate or to give them resources. There's not really 
the way to make people see things that they're not ready to do. So also for us, having acceptance over what we can and cannot do um, can be helpful. And I think sometimes it's, um, at least for me, false reassurance is not super helpful. It almost makes things worse. Um, so sharing a little bit, it's okay to share a little bit and your family and friends worry about you, you know, and to say, yeah, this is a scary time, it's a scary situation, right? We as psychiatrists, we're used to um, dealing with irrational anxiety. <laughs> but this situation, there's a lot of really rational, like, um, uh, worries, right? Uh, and so we can't just say, oh, that's, that's not real, right? It is real. Um, so it's okay to share a little bit in their worries and fears about you. Um, do some reassurance also, right? I'm doing everything I can to keep myself safe. Um, but, you know, being honest and open with them. And I think that also kind of opens up a channel for you to share your own worries too and to connect with that. Um, and that helps with your own anxieties also. Um, so I think there's going to be a boom in the post-COVID psychiatry business. I think when I think about the return to work strategy, I'm thinking we all could benefit from our own... Uh, little psychotherapy, psychoanalysis time, I think. Uh, so look forward to a, a big uptick. Yeah, and we could, all, we could all benefit from that all the time. So <laughs> even now, I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah, I think if it brings people in, we're excited about that. Manny, do we have questions from the ether world? Nope. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, guys.